Yeah. Us now. Good, good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to welcome members back to the committee after the summer recess and I'd also like to take the opportunity to congratulate our former members, Mary Goujon and Richard Lockhead, on their ministerial appointments and uh, thank them for the contribution that they have made uh, to the work of the committee. Uh, our first item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item four in private. Are members agreed? Our second item of business today is an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations, Michael Russell, MSP, and Ian Mitchell, Deputy Director for EU Strategy and Migration in the Scottish Government. And can I congratulate the, ca congratulate the Cabinet Secretary on your new role? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I understand that you wish to make an opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be brief, but uh, I last gave evidence to the committee in March on the continuity bill. And since then, the Scottish Government has presented evidence in support of our long-standing position on these negotiations, for example, on security and justice and on the economic impact of Brexit on the seafood trade, which has been provided to you. And I'm glad to be back here to discuss the negotiations and the engagement of the Scottish Government. But let me just comment briefly on the issue of no deal, which I think will detain us for some time this morning. In recent weeks, the UK Government's technical notices have laid bare the risks facing Scottish business, the economy and public services, and they add to the uncertainty and indeed chaos surrounding Brexit. The Scottish Government will continue to make responsible preparations for EU withdrawal, however regrettable these are, including drafting and presenting necessary legislative measures. But the UK Government should rule out a disastrous no deal and focus instead on securing the best outcome for all of us, which, short of staying in the EU, is remaining part of the single market and the customs union. It's no secret we've been frustrated by the quality of engagement there's been with the UK government on negotiations. The UK government needs to engage with the devolved administrations meaningfully to agree the detail of negotiating positions and ensure that Scotland's interests are protected in workable proposals. Brexit continues to present significant implications for the UK's constitutional arrangements, a matter we predicted in Scotland's place in Europe almost two years ago. The UK government sought this parliament's consent and it was refused. If the UK government believes it can proceed, then the Sewell Convention is of very little value in protecting this parliament and the wider interests of Scotland. So it's time to look again at how we can embed the requirement for the Scottish government's consent in law and to strengthen intergovernmental processes. I said yesterday at the Finance and Constitution Committee, and I repeat again today, that uh, Brexit has turned out to be too heavy uh, for devolution to bear. There require now to be substantial changes, uh, and those are ideas that we are bringing to the table along with others, including the Welsh Government. I I'm happy to discuss those issues and many others with you today. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I begin by asking you what discussions took place between the Scottish and UK Government ahead of the publication of the UK's white paper on the future relationship in July, the um, so-called Chequers Agreement? I I'm happy to, to, to talk you through that. Uh, we had a discussion at the first meeting of the Ministerial Forum in May, which was held in Edinburgh, on the contents of the White Paper, and that was a useful discussion, and we were pleased with that engagement. We, we were shown a, a list of contents. It didn't turn out in the end to be the final list of contents, but we were shown a list of contents, and we discussed that uh, in outline. Uh, the engagement then went downhill considerably. Uh, we were eventually shown, I think, two, possibly three groups of chapters, five chapters in all, the procedure for us seeing of those was tortuous. Uh, they required to be sent to the permanent secretary and then uh, we were allowed to look at them, ministers were allowed to look at them. One of those in, I did not see until the day the, for essentially the white paper was published. Um, two of them were mentioned at a ministerial forum the week before the white paper, but we were not allowed to see any paper on them. What happened, and this sounds scarcely credible, but I will just tell you what happened, is that the minister, uh, Robin Walker, read a precy of the chapters to us in the meeting. It was like really you know, eating in a medieval monastery. Somebody read something to you while you just sat at the table. Uh, we, both the Welsh and ourselves, objected very strongly to this. To be fair, I don't think the ministers present at that meeting uh, had seen the, the chapters themselves. There was no other engagement, and we didn't see a final draft until... The, the following week, uh, just before it was published, I think the, just the day before it was published, we saw the final paper. So that's the process. Uh, now, there were 
in those five chapters, the, the possibility of saying that factually doesn't work or that factually doesn't work. But in terms of an engagement on the process and influencing the matter, it was virtually non-existence. And it was a sort of nodding to the existence of the devolved administrations, but no real engagement with them. Yeah, just pick up on the point that you made that the ministers, in your view, the UK ministers that were reading out the chapters hadn't, hadn't seen them themselves. So I, 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 I did not ask and they did not tell. But my view would be, uh, my expectation from what I've seen over the last two years, is that they also would not have seen a full version. I did know before the Chequers meeting uh, that there would be the papers presented would include uh, a draft of the white paper and would also include apparently a very scary paper about no deal. Um, but we never saw those papers before they were presented. We made the point both, and I made the point to David Liddington and also to, to, to uh, the Secretary of State for Scotland, that it was important that we were involved in those discussions. And I have made that point to David Liddington again last week um, on the issue of the no deal preparations. Now, to be fair, I've had private conversations with David Liddington about those, um, one conversation with D Dominic Raab, uh, and, but again, we're not seeing the material in anything like a, a way that can make a meaningful contribution. We are asked if the material is legally and factually correct. We're not engaged in the process of drafting that material. If I, if I can use two examples which perhaps illustrate it in the last 24 hours, yesterday at 1.37, officials were uh, sent 30 slides on a subject which is to be discussed with the EU this morning. Our officials were meant to comment factually uh, on those slides. That's not consultation, uh, that's fact-checking. And today, the announcement on the seasonal worker scheme we read about on the BBC website. We've not seen it before, although we've been deeply engaged in that issue. It is an issue on which I have made repeated representations, uh, and it seems to presage a sectoral ap uh, approach which we find unsatisfactory. Uh, have there been <coughs> any areas at all where you feel that you have been able to feed into the UK government and it has actually affected the outcome of the, the paper that's eventually been written? Well, if we don't see the paper, by definition, that doesn't happen. I think that, you know, the role that Mark Drakeford and I have performed and, and now uh, is performed in the ministerial forum is to stake out the areas where we believe we have an interest, to say what that interest is, and to ask for that to be considered and included. The UK government will say that we have influenced... You know, a range of decisions I, I get quoted to me, things that I've said on a, a variety of issues. I, I don't feel that that's the case. And we certainly don't believe that the, uh, what we call the upstream engagement, which is what we think we need to have, and indeed is in the written terms of reference of the JMC, uh, has actually been observed. Uh, it, I described it yesterday as a tick box exercise. There is a feeling to that. I, I did raise strong objections to an item at the Ministerial Forum in Cardiff, I won't give you the detail of the item, which in my view in a deck of slides for the negotiations misrepresented the situation in Scotland, and I did receive an apology and an assurance that that had been corrected and corrected with the uh, task force as well. So there are occasions on which we're able to say, sorry, this is not correct. But in terms of active participation and putting points of view, it's very hard to do. We talked extensively at a previous meeting where, where you spoke to this committee about the JMC in terms of reference and how they were not being adhered to. Um, in terms of the new ministerial forum on EU negotiations, it doesn't sound to me as if there's been any improvement there in terms of engagement. Well, we hope, we always hope there can be improvement. The first meeting and the meeting at which we could discuss the, uh, the contents of the white paper was a positive meeting. The two since then have been more difficult. Um, one was spent documents being read to us, which was a you know, complete farce. The second one, the last one in Cardiff, I think we did engage on a number of issues. The next one, which will be held in 10 days' time, <coughs> is looking at uh, agriculture, uh, um, agri-food, um, one or two environment issues. We've agreed that the Ministerial Forum should involve ministers from the Scottish Government as well as the Welsh Government and the UK Government, so uh, there will be at that uh, other Scottish ministers. I think um, Fergus Ewing will be attending that. And it's being held on the same day as the DEFRA ministers' meeting, which is helpful. And we would hope that that would influence the discussion at that stage on the negotiations on agricultural issues. Um, and remember, of course, that you know, we are in a double process. The, the process at the moment is the exit process, 
then there's a future relationship process. So you know, we would hope that the influence would, would build uh, so that in the future relationship process, we were representing what the devolved administrations were responsible for uh, in the widest sense and how those were dealt with. But we have no guarantees. Obviously, um, the Chequers deal doesn't cover services uh, in terms of uh, the single access to the single market. And I would assume, given the importance of services uh, to the Scottish economy and to our export um, to Europe, you would have raised that. Did it come as a surprise to you that services weren't included in the Chequers? Well, I can understand what the Chequers Agreement is trying to achieve. I mean, you know, according to reports we read yesterday and today, it, it is not going to achieve that. Uh, and the view of, of Mr. Barnier appears to be that it is essentially dead in its present form. We've always felt that the distinction being drawn between services and goods is an inaccurate one, uh, and one that's difficult to, 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 to essentially to police and to justify. If I can give you one example, which I think illustrates it particularly well, it's in my own constituency. Uh, I opened a, a small hydro scheme in the village of Dalavik in the, in the spring, uh, which is a, a village, a forestry village next to Loch Awe. They've been working for years to have a, a, their own hydro scheme. It, the turbine is made in the Czech Republic, uh, and it's supplied by a company in the Czech Republic, but it's not supplied just as a turbine, put that in and forget about it. It's supplied with maintenance, and it's also monitored on a 24-hour basis from the Czech Republic. You know, so it, that's goods and services, and they're indivisible, as is, for example, the contract to install an MRI scanner. You know, they, they, they are often made, uh, Siemens makes them, the bulk of them, they're not put in and then somebody else maintains them. That is a goods and services contract. So trying to distinguish between goods and services is a difficult matter, and I don't think it, it, it's likely to succeed. We tend to think of services as, as being financial services or legal services, but actually services are much more complex than that. Yeah. But obviously that's stuff that you have been feeding in in your, uh, your meetings with UK ministers that's not been taken on board. Well, I mean, I, th I, think, the, I think to be entirely fair... I think our position is sometimes known because we publicise our position, we write about our position, we publish where we are. So you know, we, we don't have to spend our, all our time staking it out. We say this is our position as we've written on it. And I think that, you know, they would be aware that we're very sceptical about the Chequers uh, proposals. Um, we, I, at the last ministerial forum, uh, made the point, I think was agreed, that the, it, in order for it to be successful in any way, it has to be an evolutionary position. It's not a final position. But the Prime Minister is presenting it as a final position. But in actual fact, the language that's also selling it is, as I say, it will evolve and change. It can't be both. Thank you very much. I'll now pass over to Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, the Cabinet Secretary this morning has um, called on the UK Government to rule out a no-deal scenario. But clearly the Government have published technical papers over the summer in certain areas where they are looking at what might happen in these circumstances. And the EU has also published a number of, um, of preparedness notes in the, in the scenario that there could be a, a no-deal exit. Um, have the Scottish Government been able to contribute to any of those? And also, have the Scottish Government given consideration to whether we need to prepare Scotland-specific um, preparations in the event that there could be a no-deal Brexit? Yes, we've done both of those. Um, we have contributed in the sense that we've fact-checked and legally checked, uh, it, sometimes in a short time scale. Uh, the notes, I think all of them have been published so far. Did we see them all? There were some we didn't uh, see. Some, it was variable, but it yeah. was fact checked. Those that we've seen, we've fact checked uh, and made suggestions on. Um, we are sort of between a rock and a hard place on this, and, and I think we have to recognize that. We do not want a no deal. We think a no deal is ridiculous and disastrous, and it's an indictment of the UK government we're in that position. But equally, we have a duty to protect Scotland from the consequences that might arise. So we have um, gone along with the publication. Uh, we have made our views known on it. Uh, we will uh, it, take the legislative steps we need to take, and I made that clear, I think, in what I said in the programme for government debate on Tuesday, uh, and I'll make a statement next week on that uh, in the chamber of how we'll take that forward. It's a considerable burden, a uh, legislative burden, and we'll have to take that forward. On specific issues, such as medicines and the stockpile of medicines, there is an interaction between Gene Freeman's department and the UK Department of Health, and that will be true in other departments where there's uh, preparations to be made. And quite clearly, we continue to look at any issues that will be Scottish-specific. For example, if there were to be no 
<coughs> new trading arrangements in, in place, what would be the implications for um, Grangemouth? What would be the implications for um, Larne and Stranraer uh, route? What would, would take place? And we have to work on those, and we are working on those. So a great deal of work is being done on the no-deal scenario. That's the responsible thing to do. But it would be far better if there was an acknowledgement that that simply could not happen. And there is, there is a ready-made solution that takes us beyond that, which is the single market and the customs union position. And I, I, I was very supportive of seeing last night Keir Starmer saying they wouldn't support the free trade option, you know, which is not nearly as good as a single market and customs union option. So I think there is a, I wouldn't say an identity, but I think there's a growing recognition across the sphere, with the exception of the Conservatives, that there, are, there is no, many alternatives to a no deal and that, that those need to be taken. Um, while I would agree with uh, much of that, the Conservative government are handling negotiations and they are still, um, the, option, the possibility of a no deal is, is still on the table. Um, the papers that were, just, that were published by the UK government, uh, the 24 notes, were partly intended to give advice to the sectors and to businesses. Would the Scottish government intend to publish any, I know you've said there is work underway, but is there an intention to publish um, any materials for businesses within those sectors? And is there discussions ongoing with those particular it, businesses and sectors would, that might be affected? It wouldn't be our intention to supplement those papers unless we felt, felt there was a material deficiency in terms of Scotland. Now, we haven't identified that. If we found a material error that they couldn't, they wouldn't change. We would undoubtedly correct that publicly. But at the present moment, we haven't got that thought. We also have to guard against two other things. One is saying that we can do everything, everything to avert the, the dangers of a no deal, that we can cope with a no deal. This is the Prime Minister's language, you know, it's not the end of the world and all the rest of it. We don't know, by definition, what a no deal would look like. Uh, so it's very difficult to plan absolutely for it. The other thing we can't do, it, 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 we should do, is avoid the momentum to a no deal. I've heard, for example, in the European Parliament, some very distinguished voices saying that one of the dangers of this is once people like the financial sector start to prepare for a no deal, then there's a momentum towards a no deal. And we need to make sure that we, we don't contribute towards that. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a careful approach needs to be taken. Uh, but for this Parliament, the biggest issue will be to make sure that we have in place a legislative framework that means that we, we are correcting the deficiencies. Now, that will require us also to accept uh, some uh, UK um, uh, uh, stat statutory instruments. Now, you know, we have a position on Brexit legislation in terms of Sewell, but there, is, there are some compromises to be made on that simply to make the statute book work, and that's our obligation. Thank you. Thank you. Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you. I, I um, I didn't want to leave the European Union either, Mr Russell, but we're going to. Uh, and similarly on no deal, to, to follow Claire Baker's very fair line of questioning, um, I think we've got to do all we, have to, we can to prepare for it. So I don't follow the logic. I mean, I understand politics of why you say what you say, but I don't think a business, the skipper of the Serene that I was on in Lerwick Harbour on, on uh, Monday afternoon would thank me or you for not being ready in every possible way, just in case that's what happens. So to continue Claire Baker's line of questioning, isn't it the government's mm -hmm. responsibility to absolutely absolutely publish any analysis and their best, um, well, their best analysis of how our business is going to cope uh, if, if, we leave, if we fall off that cliff edge, because there's got to be a fair chance that now happens. Well, of course. And I mean, I've not said anything to the contrary. I mean, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with it. Well, I think this is about practical issues for businesses, well, the length and breadth of Scotland. But that, that's why we are taking a pragmatic view and working with the UK government on no deal. Uh, you know, on, the, on the politics side and the constitutional side, uh, you know, we are against the legislation. Sure, but... Uh, but, you know, on, we are making a distinction between no deal and other matters. I mean, that is, that is not only clear what I'm saying now, it will be even clearer next week. We are putting in place all the arrangements we can. We are doing all the work that we can. But equally, it would be utterly irresponsible of me not to say that the consequences of a no deal are, in many regards, unknown because it has never happened before. And in these circumstances, it is not possible to say, as the Prime Minister is saying, oh, well, it's not the end of the world, we'll just get through it. We don't know what will happen. Now, my own view is, you know, and again, you know, we may disagree on this, but I hope not, I think the prospect of a no deal has been deliberately talked up in order to frighten the Brexiteers away from it, and has now got a momentum of its own. And therefore, we should try and work against that momentum, because I do think at the end of the day, a no deal actually means lots of small deals. 
There are some things which would have to be cobbled together at the end of, uh, at the end of March, simply because it's impossible for things to continue without it. But, you know, where we are now is the result of utter incompetence. And it is completely wrong of us to say, OK, that doesn't matter because, you know, we'll muddle through. There are things we just can't know. Mm. And it would be very foolish of us to say, we know that, everything will be all right. I, I, I don't dissent from any of that, but I'm trying to divorce um, what I could... I could enter into the flights of rhetoric and all the politics of it as well, but I'm trying to divorce that from the practicalities of being a fishing skipper in Lerwick or, or in your, your constituency yeah. as well, uh, a fish processing business that, try to, that yeah. will be trying to export to Boulogne mm -hmm. on the 1st of April next year, etc., etc., etc. And the only bit on the Scottish... I looked at the Scottish Government website right now. The only thing I can find uh, in relation to your answer to Claire Baker a moment or so ago is a letter that was written to health boards on health products on the 23rd of August. That's the only thing on... I mean, I may not be able to navigate your website correctly, but it's the only thing I can find that is practically there about what would happen then. So uh, just help me understand well, what the government's actually doing well, for all of us to there understand... There are three tranches of UK documents on No Deal, the first of which has been published. There are two more to come. We have cooperated in their publication. We have fact-checked them and legally checked them where we have been asked to do so. And we have made it clear that these are available and these are the UK government's guides, right? We're not adding to those unnecessarily. You know, some of them we disagree with, but we've not published an analysis of each of them, which I could do. You know, I think the trading one, frankly, is irresponsible because what it says is we'll just carry on as things are now. I don't think that will happen. But that's what we've done. Where there are areas which we have to take additional steps, as in health, we will take those steps. As time goes on, we will look at those and see if we can provide more. But let's, let's boil this down absolutely to individuals. Let's go. You go to Shetland, you know, to Lerwick. Let me go to Tarbert on Loch Fine. And there are people exporting live langoustines, Precisely. you know, yeah. and they do not, they are not live if they sit on the M20 for five days. Now, I do not, I have no solution to that. There is no solution that the Scottish Government can offer because the UK Government doesn't offer a solution to that. You know, if, the, if that problem occurs, there is nothing that we can say or do that will make those langoustines get through those circumstances. I was in Grangemouth last week talking, uh, 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 launching our trade paper, and I talked to, to people at the port. You know, they have no idea what will happen on the, the, 1st of April, the 30th of March next year. None whatsoever at the present moment. Now... My job also is within the negotiating structure to try and get that information you know, and to find the person who has it, if there is one, and I think that is the issue. But at the present moment, six months away, they don't know what's going to happen. Is there going to be a massive new customs operation? We just don't know. And I can't tell people that. No, I, I entirely, you know, it is impossible. No, I entirely accept all that. But uh, you make a fair point about langoustines from, from uh, Tarbert. Um, in the Financial Times today, the ports on the northeast of England are investing money in new port facilities and mm -hmm. lorry parks to try and get around Kent mm -hmm. becoming a lorry park. In other words, their yeah. scenario planning for what may happen mm -hmm. uh, in the context of trade. Do you not think it would be fair for government here in Scotland to be part of that scenario planning and saying that we want to avoid... I entirely agree with you. We want to avoid Dover because it will grind to a, mm -hmm. an 18-mile roadblock. Is it not, would it not be the right thing to do to scenario plan on the basis of other ways in which we can export our products well, to the uh, European uh, uh, Union? Of course, and there are, for example, plans, you know, there's the Northern Irish route that's being talked about and how Indeed. that will take place, and we, will, we do support those. I speak to businesses on a, almost a daily basis, so do my colleagues. It would be wrong to say that we are not doing that, but it's equally wrong to say there, are, there is some easy solution to this, I'm you know, and we will, just, we will just wave a wand and it will happen. No. There is no easy solution. No, I'm not this. suggesting, and I don't think anyone on this committee would suggest it's easy, but I think we're all, or I'm certainly arguing that um, the scenario planning, we, rather than saying we can't do anything because we don't know anything, I think we need to scenario plan, and I'm suggesting, and you make a very good example of the seafood industry, it's probably the best example of real-time product that needs to be exported on the 1st of April. And, Should and we not be pl planning well, for Well, of that? course, if there were ways to do so, and we could find ways well, to do so, well, there may not be ways to do so. But there may not be ways to do so, and particularly now. I mean, one of the issues also, this is preparedness. Uh, you know, I, I look constantly at businesses and their preparedness and talk to them. I did an event on Tuesday night in a sector in Scotland where a number of businesses were only just saying, what do you think we're going to do in, in six months' time? Now, I'm not criticising them, but that is also mm. an issue. Mm. And, and what actually has focused people, and a lot of this work is now going on, is the issue of no deal. People have suddenly become focused upon that, mm -hmm. and that's you know, profoundly disturbing. 
but you know, we, we will do and continue to do everything we can to help, and we will go on doing that. Mm. You know, so we have made that crucial distinction. You know, I, I think uh, uh, Adam Tompkins was saying in the programme for government debate last week that people were saying to him they just want the Scottish government to carry on and work with the UK government on Brexit. Well, the UK government hasn't got a plan on Brexit. It's got half a dozen plans, none of which will work. But we make an absolute clear distinction between that chaos and what we are trying to do to protect Scotland. That's our job. And you recognise that business of every kind, big, small, whatever, is desperately, well, apart from the ones you mentioned who've, who are only kind of waking up to it now, but most I meet are certainly saying, how are we going to survive on the first of it if they're an export business? Hmm. So that, that we need to support that. And of I, course. I just and, don't and see we'll do everything happen. we possibly can to do so. Right. But we, mustn't, we must also be realistic about what the barriers are to that. That allows us to try and overcome them. And there are considerable barriers to it, not least the lack of knowledge of what's taking place. Okay, thank you. Ross Green. Thank you, uh, Convener. Just to drill down, uh, drill down on this a little bit more, Cabinet Secretary. I completely understand what you're saying about the impossibility of knowing what no deal would look like. And as you say, even a no deal would have a range of small individual crisis deals uh, inside it. Um, but as Tavis Scott and, and Claire Baker made the point, scenario planning can be done, um, except what you said about not wanting to replicate the UK government's papers, but again there's a, a distinction between um, trying to assess what the impact may be and the second stage of that, which is how to mitigate that impact, how to cope with it. Has the Scottish government completed scenario planning? Is there existing scenario planning documentation in these various areas that you are responsible for? Each of our portfolios is working on a range of, 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 of possibilities and options. Uh, and my responsibility is to meet with them on occasion from time to time, discuss those, and to make sure their preparations are in place. Those are primarily legislative at the moment, because the most important thing we have to do at this particular moment is make sure that there is no legislative cliff edge. There, there is, for example, a structure that can continue to pay agricultural subsidy. You know, that would be utterly irresponsible if there wasn't. Uh, in terms of the departments that deal with business, they are also in active discussion with business about things they can do to help, just as the health side is and all the rest of it. And over a period of time, they will refine those and be in a position to provide as much help as they can. So that is also a position of Scottish Enterprise. But, you know, we have to say that that is an uncertain process because we don't know many of the things. We don't know, for example, at the moment, we've seen a third of the papers from the UK government. So we don't know what their proposals are on all those particular areas. So we, we continue to do everything we can do, and we will go on doing so. I accept that your work is ongoing. That I suppose what we are trying to assess here is what you intend to release into the public domain to allow others to prepare or to at least understand what the impact may be. So this work is ongoing within presumably every government department. What are your intentions for publication of your scenario plan? It is not our intention to publish anything in addition to the notices that the UK government has unless we believe those are required. Right? So at the present moment, we look at the papers as we get them and we say, is there anything to add to these? You know, we could subtract from them and say, you know, frankly, we don't think any of this will work, but we are not going to publish anything unnecessary. If there are areas where we need to do it, then we'll do it. That, that comes back to the distinction between much of what is in the UK government's papers is uh, about how to, how to deal with the situation. It's as, as I just said, that second step, how, how to mitigate for the impact of no deal. What I'm asking you about is assessments the governments have made of the impact of no deal. So accepting that you don't want to replicate their proposals for how we deal with it, even just uh, laying out, publishing a projection of what that will look but like. We, we, we've published the financial projections. We did that you know, in uh, Scotland's Place in Europe in 2016, you know, and we, we updated that in January this year. We, we know the financial projections of that doing that. But we doing know it's that. about much more than just the finances. Well, we know it impacts indeed, the health service. We know it will impact farming and, in a way and that's, that's not just why financial. the health service I specifically referred to is in discussion over the issue of stockpiling medicines. That's why, for example, you know, I have raised this week the issue of veterinary medicines, which has not yet been tackled, and said we need to look at that and make sure that we have a, a plan in place for this. But, you know, there is a level in which the whole effort of the government might then become focused uh, on no-deal planning uh, to the expense of everything else. Now, as Tavish Scott has indicated, it is one option amongst many. 
um, and you know, we have to also have a, a sense of balance and proportion on this. You know, the, the, the three options that are presently on the table, short of staying in the EU, and incidentally I do not rule that out as an option, I don't think any of us should ever rule that out as an option, uh, are uh, single market and customs union membership, a, a, a free trade deal of some sort, uh, and the, the, the no deal scenario. And you know, we have to be prepared for all of those, but we should also spend a considerable time arguing for the one that we believe is least damaging and working on that, and that is single market and customs union membership. I agree with that political position, as you're uh, aware. I think, again, that there's a distinction here. I don't think we are asking you to do more work on a no-deal scenario. I think what we're asking is about the publication of putting into the public realm the work the government is clearly already doing, so that the public can understand well, what the potential I, I don't want is. to add to the sense of uncertainty and, and, and panic in this, but I will consider your request. But I, I just think that that would be focusing us where you know, we have enough to do in the legislative side, for example. There's an unlimited ability to do things. We will try and do so. I've been prepared to cooperate with the UK government on this. I would have thought that would have been welcome in terms of you know, supporting the publication of the notices. But I'm just reluctant to c carry on adding to this. OK, I think, I think we'll come back to this over weeks and months. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. I mean, just to follow on this, this conversation. So, if, if I take you correctly, you're saying that your cabinet colleagues across their respective portfolios are doing comprehensive planning of all scenarios, um, but you're not willing to publish any of that, any of those findings, because, if I read you correctly, what's already been given by the UK government is perfectly adequate? Uh, no, you do read me incorrectly, and I'm not going to be misrepresented, if you don't mind, Mr Green, on these matters. It, my take on this is very simple. The UK government has made a complete horlicks of this situation. Uh, you know, we are faced with unprecedented chaos. Even the former, even the former government, governor of the, those even the former, views, no, these what, are, what is the Scottish these government? Are views of the view? Scottish government, the, the, and even the former governor of the Bank of England has pointed to its incompetence. Uh, we are endeavouring to ensure, first of all, that we do everything to protect Scotland in these circumstances. We are endeavouring to show that the information that the UK government is putting out on this is put out. And it is accurate, and that's what we're but trying to do. But you won't to add do. to it? Um, we will only add to it when we believe we need to add to it. Um, in addition, we are having conversations between departments to make sure that we are as prepared as we can be. But I, I do so think... So how do we know you're prepared utterly, if you won't utterly, publish any of those findings? It is utterly disingenuous to actually argue that the, the, the difficulty here is with the Scottish Government. The difficulty here is with the UK Government and the mess that it has made of this. The Scottish Government is working very hard to make sure that there is preparation and there is information. Okay. And to divert that into some sort of attack upon the Scottish Government will not assist okay, look, Scottish businesses. Uh, the Minister, you know, Secretary, you're perfectly entitled to your own political views on what you think the UK Government is or isn't doing, and that's fine, and those are on record. What we're asking, I think, even collectively, notwithstanding our political differences on the committee, is how do we know the Scottish Government is prepared for every possibility, and why won't it give the Scottish public and businesses any sight well, of those research. Well, uh, I will uh, make a statement uh, next week on pre preparedness. I've said that. Um, we are not prepared for every eventuality because that is impossible. Nobody knows what a no deal will bring. A no deal is an appalling prospect, which we are saying should not happen. And we're putting enormous effort in politically into saying it must not happen. Uh, and we are also working hard to make sure that, to the best of our ability, Scotland is protected. But the responsibility for getting us here is that of your UK government, and the work that we are doing is trying to protect Scotland against that work of the UK government. OK, moving on. Um, can I ask a question? Uh, we're talking about March next year, um, and nobody knows what will happen the day after we leave the EU. What is your understanding of the transition period and whether that's uh, likely to proceed, because my understanding is that that period would give uh, an interim period for to continue these quite complex trade negotiations with the EU. And, and that is what we hope will take place, undoubtedly. We hope that there will be a transition period. Uh, that is what the expectation of the EU is. But there has been a upping of the rhetoric on the issue of a no deal from the UK government in the last few months, I think originally designed to frighten the Brexiteers, and that has caused this situation. A transition period I've argued for from the beginning, uh, the UK government, if you remember, was against it to start with and didn't want a transition period. It is essential it takes place. Many of us think that it will have to last longer than the present plan because it will be impossible to put in place the new relationship uh, thereafter. 
Okay. And my final question is around, uh, uh, obviously, you, you, you're uh, saying that the official Scottish Government position is that your preference is for uh, single market access and uh, a customs union with the EU. Uh, what discussions have uh, the Scottish Government had with the EU on what the terms of that membership may be? Because it appears that the rhetoric coming from the EU is that you can't have single market access and full customs union without being a full EU member. What is your understanding of well, that? Well, that's not the rhetoric coming from the EU. The, what the EU is saying, quite accurately, is you can be a member and have full access to everything. But there are other options, and the other option, you know, uh, which I suspect is is the more likely option in this area, at, in a transitionary way, would be to be a member of the EEA, uh, as Norway is, as Iceland is. Now, it's not as good as full membership, but it gives you membership of, uh, essentially membership of the single market. You observe the four freedoms. Uh, and that is a, was always designed as a way in and has actually become a sort of holding pen for those people who are neither in nor out. Um, but, you know, Scotland's, the ambition that the Scottish Government has is, to re is, first of all, to remain in the EU, which, of course, was the vote of the Scottish people, uh, but if we are out, is to re-enter. And, of course, in those circumstances, that the entry would be negotiated. I could point you to John Kerr, a bigger expert on Europe than you or I, who regards it as the easiest accession on record. And that's what he thinks it will be. But, of course, there will be work to be done on that, work which is created by the, uh, the fact that the UK government is ignoring the will of the Scottish people who decided to stay. So I appreciate that you, uh, again, have a view on whether the UK should stay in the EU or not, but the reality is the UK is leaving the EU. Uh, but you said there that you're looking at re-entry. Uh, so what type of re-entry to the EU is it you're, you're looking well, for? Well, quite clearly we would want to be a full member of the EU. I mean, that's but that's not going to happen, so what well, is it no, you're looking no, for? Sorry, you cannot say it is not going to happen. Uh, you ca you ca all you can say is, in your opinion, it shouldn't happen. In my opinion, we could stay. That is still a possibility. The chaos of the UK government may lead to its collapse. There is cir circumstances in which, even if we leave in March, uh, then in the transitionary period, the single market customs union often is on the table. Barnier has said that. There's a way to do that. And thereafter, the process of re-entry. That is the best option for Scotland's future. That is also what Scotland voted for. You know, and we are representatives of the Scottish people. It was a UK-wide vote, I should add. That is what the Scottish people voted for. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr Green doesn't speak for me when he mentions the word uh, collectively uh, earlier on. But uh, this Parliament yesterday heard from the UK uh, Trade Minister uh, on, uh, on the issue of uh, consultation and dialogue. Uh, but we heard once again this morning from yourself, uh, but also we've got the, the record of uh, of the, uh, the lack of consultation and dialogue uh, from the UK government to the Scottish government. So, uh, in terms of going forward with our bill, certainly, first of all, with the trade, uh, potential trade agreement, um, how, how can we actually trust anything that uh, any UK government minister actually says, bearing in mind the appalling record of dialogue and consultation that's taken place thus far? Well, I, I don't want to personalise this. I simply think that the relationship, the trust between the two governments, I've said this publicly before, is at its lowest ebb ever. <coughs> and it requires to, that trust requires to be rebuilt. Uh, it can only be rebuilt by having a framework, a structure, that allows us to build it on. Uh, Taoiseach said something very interesting uh, earlier this year when he was talking about trust within the EU. He said, you know, trust doesn't come simply because you want it to come. It comes because there is a legal structure and a framework on which you can build. Uh, and there is, you know, in the JMC process, you know, a, a structure, there needs to be a renewal uh, of these structures in a way that's meaningful and they need to have statutory authority. And then if we can build on them in that way, uh, then there might be a, a, an improvement. That would require the commitments made to be honoured. And the commitments made are not honoured. Um, and, you know, there may be many reasons of them. We now know, for example, that the staff turnover in DEXU is at 50%. You know, uh, there's a huge inexperience in, in that department, uh, and there's also a huge pressure in that department. And quite clearly, civil servants are also nervous about you know, what their ministers want to share and don't share, and that's an issue as well. But it could be rebuilt, and I do try very hard to keep open, constructive channels of, of engagement and discussion, and that's what we should do. Thanks for that. I mean, what you just said there, uh, I wasn't planning to kind of get into this area, but what you just said there was really interesting, that a 50% turnover, does that then indicate or highlight that, that uh, when, there are, when there are new people who have came in, uh, it makes the job of the Scottish Government officials harder 
to actually get the message over and, and also potentially even explain what devolution actually is, never mind uh, the present day situation? Well, I am sure the committee will have read the PACAC report and, and will have reflected upon it. And you know, what that indicates is that there is a severe lack of knowledge of devolution within the UK government, within you know, those who are operating as part of the UK government. That's, that's just the reality. I gave evidence to the PACAC inquiry, and I, I think they have uh, you know, uh, summed it up pretty well. Uh, there is, David Cameron said, I think, after the 2014 referendum, that, we, that, that the UK had devolved and forgot. And, and, and that has happened, but they've forgotten what devolution is and how it operates, very largely. There is no hierarchy of governments in devolution. It's really important that people understand that. There is a hierarchy of parliaments in devolution. But governments deal with different issues. And it is that respect for the dealing with different issues that I think is lacking, or understanding that that is the situation. There also needs to be an understanding that devolution you know, was... Uh, uh, an issue that arose, well, it's been around for a long time, but essentially it was 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, you know, there's now a very heavy weight on it from Brexit, and devolution will have to change. Now, we, we, we presaged this in Scotland's Place in Europe in, in, 2000, in 2016, December 2016. Yes. Chapter 4 was headed, Further Devolution and the, consequent, the Constitutional Consequences of Brexit. You know, uh, that chapter is worth looking at again, because we pointed out that there were areas now which we expected Brexit would, 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 would create issues for, for the constitutional settlement would need to change. Um, three in particular, uh, one of which was the key rights, the issue of rights, and uh, we outlined employment law, e equalities, health and safety at work and consumer protection as areas where there needed to be additional devolution. Another one was the whole issue of, of freedom of the four freedoms and how we reacted to those, and we out outlined areas of involvement, including trade areas. And the final was international engagement, and we raised the issue of a separate, a, a distinct legal personality, so that we could take part in international engagement. Now, those issues, which we laid out in 2016, now need discussion, and we're not alone in that. The Welsh Government is, is saying the same thing. The Welsh Government published a paper last year on the operation of devolution. So, you know, first of all, whatever happens mustn't undermine the current settlement, but then we should be saying, and I'd much rather have independence, but we should be saying, it, you know, at the present moment, we need also, along with the Welsh, along with the Northern Irish, to look at devolution and its evolution uh, rather than stand still, because Brexit has changed things. Uh, can just, one other question I'd like to just touch upon. That's an issue of uh, intergovernmental relations, and uh, you've highlighted some of this stuff earlier on in your uh, opening comments. Uh, now, it's clear that the intergovernmental relations has been a problem uh, for some time, uh, and certainly in the previous session. Uh, at the devolution for the Pills Committee, which Travis Scott and I we were uh, members of at the time, we published the report in October 2015 uh, on the issue of the IGR. Um, do you see any improvement uh, in, a, in the whole intergovernmental relations mechanisms or machinery in any way, shape or form to actually provide some, uh, some hope uh, for the future when uh, when the UK, uh, if it does uh, leave the European Union? Not at the present moment. Um, I think there are ideas on the table. I've indicated those ones. There are Welsh ideas on the table. And of course, the JMC plenary uh, agreed in earlier this year that there would be a review of, of, of the, the relationships and the JMC mechanism. Uh, and of course, we have, we have proposed a review of the Sewell mechanism, and, and we'll bring forward some ideas on that shortly. So there, are, there, are, there is activity in it. But there has to be a commitment to that. I, I see little commitment, despite words in the UK government, for that, those changes and those reviews, uh, which is a pity, but that's where it is at the moment. And we need to bring forward some energy into that. Uh, do, you, do you believe that the UK government is actually listening to anyone outside of Whitehall? I think there are individuals who recognise that things have to change. It's a very centralised government. Uh, I'm not sure the Prime Minister thinks things have to change. But I think there are individuals who realise that things have to change. Uh, and things have to, uh, uh, you know, it can't go on like this. Um, but whether they will prevail or not, I don't know. I think there are also individuals uh, you know, who are deeply hostile to devolution. And, uh, you know, some of those might uh, assume power at some stage. Uh, and that would be damaging. Thank you. The review that you mentioned, have you had any indication of what progress <laughs> might be made? I don't think anything, I'm aware of anything happening as yet. Is this on the intergovernmental yes. review? 
Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the process is, uh, ha has commenced, but uh, no I outcome. think, as Mr Russell said, it's the degree of commitment to it and the, the pace behind it is not yet established yet. But the, 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 the process is underway. There is yeah. agreement uh, around so the process. So what, what is the process? You know, like, is there other meetings? Are there... Yeah, it's, 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 it's with civil servants at the minute to scope right. out uh, the, the nature of, of what will be covered under intergovernmental review. Obviously, the uh, uh, Brexit and the weight of Brexit uh, is, is a, an initial feature for discussion and how, how it's coped under, under that pressure. So that, yeah. that, that's been the early uh, so have they, So you, they're scoping at the moment. Have they given you any idea of the timescale for the review? No, that's no. Not, not clear at this stage. No. Right, OK, thanks very much. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We've had a, a lot of good discussion already this morning, and to some of the questions I want to ask already have been covered. But you talk about the chaos, and I think that's the word you used, uh, the potential chaos that, that we face in the scenario uh, of, of a no deal. Uh, but you also talk about the chaos in the scenario where we maybe do have a deal that still doesn't give individuals, organisations, the, the confidence uh, to manage the process. Uh, uh, You've given a very strong picture of what's happening in Scotland. Are you aware of what the, the UK government are doing south of the border uh, with organisations, individuals, to ensure that there's risk assessments, the scenarios taking place? And, and have we learned anything from any of that dialogue if that dialogue has taken place? We're not given any... We don't have any risk assessments shared with us, so we haven't seen those things. We do hear of meetings taking place. We talk to stakeholders who meet us and they also meet the UK government. They quite often come back with a sense of frustration that they don't know any more than when they went. Uh, and that seems to be the general picture. Um, you know, I, I, I think this, this issue of, of, of chaos is pretty generally held now as being what is driving things. People would like certainty. You know, I, I would like certainty because you know, I don't enjoy not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, businesses require certainty, uh, and even the No Deal papers don't give any additional certainty to people. So I think that's, uh, in a sense, I would welcome the announcement tomorrow, this morning on the seasonal workers scheme. It is a very small step. I think it, the numbers are too low. I think inherently it admits that freedom of movement is important, you know, and I think that should be understood. Uh, you know, and, and I think the third issue in, in here, undoubtedly, is that there will require to be more because it's not enough. And it does stress a sector approach, which I think is the wrong approach. But, you know, that is the first movement there has been. Now, you know, I, I was on a visit to one of the fruit farms in Angus in early May 2017. And then people were saying to me, there has to be something soon because we're due to order uh, bushes, which, you know, there's massive orders go to Holland, uh, that we are due to ha have, you know, the next tranche of workers arriving. So it's been very long delayed. Now, it may presage the publication of the MAC uh, paper, you know, which we believe is now with government. Now, that would indicate that the MAC paper, this is the Migration Advisory Committee, is going to take a sectoral approach. You know, we have advised very strongly against that. There needs to be a whole economy approach in Scotland. Um, if it is a sectoral approach, it will not be helpful in Scotland. Uh, it will actually weaken the situation. But, you know, we might then be able to say these are the wrong things, but at least we would know what was happening. There's also no white paper on migration, yeah. uh, and that also affects it. And you, you, you've talked about the pilot scheme that's been announced, and, 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 and that is now with us. Uh, You've then, you've then gone on to discuss the, what, what you would like to see as a Scottish government role. Uh, so so these, these are the scenarios that you have put in place, and these are the scenarios that you are prepared to discuss and have dialogue on, uh, so that you... you, uh, you, yeah. you you've, as I say, we've, we've talked about you know, the, the, the whole United Kingdom being, but, but in the past you've said maybe that, that Scotland could lead on some areas of this whole process to give advice and give support. I mean, is that the case, that you would be prepared to do that and, and put the scenario out there to say that's what should be followed? I think that's a really interesting contribution, if I might say so, because I think it uses the word scenario in an accurate way. You know, we do a great deal of work and have done a great deal of work, but to, to put it into a box and say these are the scenarios, you mm -hmm. know, this is actually work that's done to say what we would like to happen Gee. and how could it happen. So if you're looking at migration, we published comprehensive work on uh, our submission mm -hmm. to the Migration Advisory Committee. Uh, we indicated what would work for Scotland, and that is a scenario, you know, and therefore that stuff is already in the public domain. Um, and 
we believed and still believe that there is a way to approach migration in Scotland which would be productive. It is actually freedom of movement because that is very helpful to us. Uh, you know, but we don't know, we know that's going to stop. Hmm. But up until today, we've had no idea of any other scheme. Now, to go back to a seasonal agricultural worker scheme, which has existed before and is a very bureaucratic response, is not the way we think we should go. But we do have our own pro projections and proposals of how it should go, and that is a scenario. So, you know, if we can revisit the issue of scenarios, then I suppose what we are getting slightly closer to, and it's helpful that Mr. Stewart's taken us there, what we are talking about is a range of material which we have published over the year. I mean, Scotland's place in Europe is a scenario, set of scenarios. So is, um, so is the role of development of trade. So is people, jobs and investment. All these things that we have published over the last uh, two years are essentially contributions to this scenario exercise. Um, and if they're seen in that way, then they're positive contributions. And the, the dialogue, as I say, that you're having, or the, it would appear the lack of dialogue that you, you portray that is taking place between the UK government and yourselves, uh, uh, there seems to be a sort of logjam or there seems to be a, a trickling of information rather than a, a, a meeting of minds and a, and, a, and, and a real connection taking place and a real uh, contribution taking place. Uh, uh, how have you managed to try and move that forward and try and ensure that, that your way of thinking is, 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 is focused more than, than the UK government's way of thinking? We, we, well, we do produce material, which the UK government by and large hasn't done. You know, so I've got a list here of actually of the publications that we've had. I think we've published 16 papers over the last two years mm -hmm. with another six in the pipeline. So we're not short of material that we put into the public domain. That's tended not to be the case. We've been very open and transparent about what we want to see happening. You know, I mean, we, we've stood absolutely four square behind the idea of single market and customs union since we published the first paper. And increasingly, people are moving in that direction. I mean, I indicated you know, Keir Starmer's response yesterday to the issue of a free trade treaty is, in my view, another step towards that. And I welcome that. I think that's very important and very helpful. So I think our position is well known and our projections are well known. Um, I think the... The difficulty in here has been the focus that has increasingly come in the last month to six weeks on the no-deal scenario, uh, and I think that therefore the expectation that the Scottish Government should jump to and provide all the answers to that is a false expectation, uh, because it is a scenario that is impossible by definition to, to, to completely scope out. We've never seen this before. But there are things in all the work that we have done that would indicate ways in which we could move forward. Also, facts about what would happen you know, in terms of the finances of that, which are very, very clear. And, you know, the, the New Deal scenario, as you say, has recently become much more prevalent. Uh, uh, but in the reality, many people believe that a deal will still be struck, uh, whether it's the complete deal that is expected or it is a partial uh, manipulate of progress moving forward. Uh, and, and, your, and your view on that, if, if, if there is a deal uh, that is expected, but it's not the complete deal that some people... It, expect, but during the transition period there will be opportunities for things to then be put together and, 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 and hardened up and, and concreted through. Well, you see, I, th I think the problem with that is you could get, uh, this is a blind Brexit scenario, you could get a high-level deal in March which said very little. And remember, that's exit, that's not future relationship. So you get a high-level deal in March which you know, eventually agrees to. There's a um, a very distinguished uh, Euro former European uh, Commission official who describes the UK's negotiating approach as being to say no at the start of each round, to refuse everything during the round, at the end of the round to suddenly say yes, and to treat it as a triumph that you move on to the next stage. That's what's happened so far. You could do that again. You know, we never thought it'd get to this stage, but you could do that again in March. But in those circumstances, the real problem with that for Scottish businesses, for uh, all organisations, is we won't know any more this time next year about some things than we know now. So, you know, Mr Scott's uh, sk skipper in, in Lerwick won't actually know what's going to happen uh, as he doesn't know now. Now, that's not what we should be encouraging to happen. We want some definition and finality to this. So a high-level outcome, a blind Brexit, has that difficulty, but it also has another difficulty. It removes even the small amount of leverage that the UK presently has in negotiation, because it has none. It is out, outside the EU. And in those circumstances, trying to get you know, a, a deal of any sort when you have no leverage is pretty, pretty difficult. So if that is what happens, you know, it happens, but it's not going to be good and helpful. My own view is that's more likely than a no deal. 
because I think you, know, you heard the noises from Germany yesterday. I think the prospect of a no deal is, is not something that anybody really wants sensibly. And I think from inside the European Parliament, you know, which was certainly what I hear in there, is that European Parliament would, would not accept no deal. They would find a, a European mechanism, whether it is the clock that stops or something like that, to ensure that there was some sort of outcome to the process. It's up to all governments to try and do as much as they can to, to ensure that that doesn't happen. And, and the dialogue and the negotiations and the discussions have to be focused on ensuring that. Uh, well, I've made that clear today in, in other material, but it takes two to tango. I, I, the UK government has to say that's not what we want. Thank you, Kenyon. Can I quickly turn to another subject, which was the, the Scottish Government's trade paper, which you brought out on the 30th of August. Um, I was pleased to see in your recommendations that you recommended the Statutory Intergovernment Trade Committee, because this committee in our first report unanimously recommended an intergovernmental trade committee um, in terms of um, ensuring that Scotland's voice was heard in future trade negotiations. I wondered if you were able to say a little bit more about the paper and uh, particularly whether any of your proposals have any realistic chance of being adopted given the evidence that George Hollingbury gave to Parliament yesterday? Well, to give George Hollingbury the, the, the benefit of the doubt, you know, that was a, an initial reaction and I don't think he'd read the paper. I hope it, it does stimulate debate and discussion. It follows on from the things we said in, in the original Scotland's Place in Europe two years ago. It, it builds upon that and it says, what would be a modern set of trade relationships and how would you, you come to them? You know, the last time the UK negotiated trading deals on its own was almost 50 years ago. It's a very different world. There has been devolution. But in addition, this parliament has set an agenda for the type of world we want to see, the type of Europe we want to see, and the type of relationships we want to have. So those would require us, for example, to be very mindful of environmental issues, you know, to look at equalities and, and, and human rights issues within trading relationships, which is the modern way that things are done. So we're saying that's necessary. We're saying that accountability and scrutiny is necessary of, of trading um, uh, deals. Uh, and that also nobody can decide for us. If, if we're dealing with our matters that are our responsibility, then we should speak for them. We've used the example of the CETA treaty in, in there, where you know, the provinces in Canada were in the room and were able then to commit to delivering. That's the, the positive example of CETA. Unfortunately, the UK government has taken the negative example of CETA to heart, which is the, the problem they had with the, 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 the Wallonian parliament in the last stages, which was resolved, you know, and was resolved in an amicable fashion. So, we are putting forward some ideas for discussion. We'll, we'll want the Parliament to discuss this. We're looking forward to people coming on board with it or making alternative suggestions. Uh, uh, Adam Tompkins yesterday in committee, I think, was, was eventually at the stage of being pleased that the um, suggestion he'd made about wording was one I'm quite happy to, to consider. You know, we're not saying we have a veto on anything. The only vetoes in devolution, we should remember, come from the UK government. They're the only body that has a veto in devolution. Nobody else has a veto. But if there should be a requirement to agree, and there should be a mechanism that makes agreement meaningful, not a sole mechanism which makes agreement pointless. Um, and all those are things which we could discuss. And I, think it's, I hope it's a helpful contribution. This committee's view will be welcome. The party's views will be welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, the reports suggest that 80% of the withdrawal agreement is agreed, and there's still 20% um, to be discussed, including the issue of the Irish border and the backstop. Um, does the Scottish Government have any views on how this could be resolved, and is there consequences in the backstop being introduced for Scotland that they think are particularly challenging for us? Or? Yes, I mean, you know, the way to resolve this is for the whole of the UK to stay in the single market and the customs union. That resolves it. Uh, you know, so, I mean, so far the UK government have said they're not going to yeah, accept but, I mean, that. So it, it, I, I recognise it's a very difficult issue to resolve and well, nobody's come up with well, a solution. Well, politics, politics is, is a process solution. of arguing cases. That's and I, I argue that case. And, and, you know, I'm pleased that the Labour Party accepts at least part of that case. And, you know, others accept all of that case. So I think that is the solution. And, and that's why we put it forward. The backstop, if it were implemented with a border down the Irish Sea, would have implications for Scotland. So would the issue of differentiation for one part of the UK but not for another part of the UK. Those are issues on which we have also made our views known. We are absolutely determined to support you know, a peaceful settlement in Northern Ireland to make everything 
not to do anything that jeopardizes that at all. Equally, we have to reflect upon the fact that if there was the opportunity for one part of the UK to stay within the single market and the customs union, it's something we ourselves have proposed for Scotland you know, two years ago, and we would want to continue to argue for that. Because it is a difficult situation, given the UK government have said that they're not supportive of a stay within the single market and the customs union, which would be the obvious solution to the situation we're facing um, with Northern Ireland. Um, so you do recognise the backstop will present challenges for Scotland. And even though you would like to see a different scenario, if we are in those set of circumstances, could you maybe say a bit more about what the challenges for Scotland will be in terms of trade in particular? And well, you know, a, a, a border in the Irish Sea will be challenging for the ports in the Irish Sea. Uh, the Northern Ireland having the ability to compete economically as a member of the full member of the single market in the customs union in Scotland not being in that position would be very challenging. Uh, you know, those are issues. There would be security issues as well. Uh, those, you know, the, the issue for us would be, you know, we don't want to do anything to disturb the situation in Northern Ireland, but we don't see why Scotland should be excluded from arrangements as we also voted. Uh, not to leave the EU, as Northern Ireland did. So that would be a negation of Scottish democracy as well. So there are very serious implications in there. We've addressed them frequently in discussion. And we'll continue to do so. But we don't, want to, we don't want to stand in the way of the right solution in Northern Ireland, particularly as that would be the right solution for Scotland as well. Okay, thank you. Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Uh, two uh, short supplementaries. Um, uh, the... Un unrelated. Um, the, the first one is uh, regarding the Parliament itself and you, obviously the, the First Minister announced a, a series of, of new bills to be introduced and uh, we're still actively working on around a dozen or so from, from last year's programme, plus members' bills, that's at least 25 pieces of, of legislation. Um, what work has the Scottish Government done uh, with the Parliament itself to ensure that the ability of committees and uh, members of this Parliament are able to process uh, uh, much of the secondary legislation that might come through uh, our Parliament over the next uh, two years, uh, in addition to the existing pieces of primary legislation that the government's putting forward. We've proposed a protocol to the Parliament that takes uh, involves the, the um, DPLR committee, which I think Mr. McMillan is, is aware of, uh, of how we handle that material. Um, but we cannot disguise the fact that it is a considerable additional burden. Uh, and it will require, uh, I think, probably more sitting time for committees, and it will require possibly more chamber time. Uh, that is where we are. Uh, you know, the number of items, we're still under review, but next week I hope to be able to give people not only a, 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 a better estimate of that, but also a, a, a view of, of what the flow will be. I indicated on Tuesday that the cut-off date for the no-deal scenario would be the 25th of January next year. So there's a great deal of material that has to go into the system before then. That also requires us, and Mr. Stewart's point, to cooperate with the UK government as much as we can. We don't like this scenario, but we're going to do so uh, on these matters. I'm sure that will be welcome. On the issue of cooperation, perhaps could I ask Mr. Mitchell uh, what your understanding is of the day-to-day -day relationship that Scottish uh, civil servants have with UK civil servants on uh, uh, issues uh, arising from Brexit and whether you feel those relationships are positive, neutral or indifferent? Yeah. I mean, as Mr Russell said earlier, it's not that there's uh, uh, no contact uh, on, no, you know, no day-to-day -day business being done between civil service. That, that, that continues. Uh, I have to say, however, the, the, the strain of Brexit and just the sheer volume of work that the UK civil service are, are, are having to shift is uh, proving a great strain along with the churn, the point Mr. Mr. Russell made, made earlier. I also have to say as well that uh, I'll call it the tightness of decision making uh, within the UK government puts officials in a, a very difficult situation as well and maybe one of the reasons why they cannot be more uh, open with us than, than they otherwise would be. Uh, and the other point is the concern around uh, security and, and, and you know, information leaking. So there are mitigating circumstances why relations would be put under strain. But uh, again, my, my experience of working on this over the last two years is that uh, we are nowhere near uh, the sort of engagement that's necessary, that sort of upstream engagement where officials are talking to officials about some of the options that may be being put forward for negotiations, you know, 
it's sounding us out early on that, us being able to, uh, to give them uh, some idea of how, how that would, would react in a safe space, because that's traditionally uh, what would have happened. That has been largely absent, and therefore everything is piled to the 11th hour. We are given documents in the sort of time frame, and everybody's feeling up under pressure and up against it. So I, I would really, uh, I think I would have to say that uh, we are nowhere near uh, the sort of engagement that's necessary to take forward such a, a, a complex issue as try, trying to get through this. Relations have, have inevitably suffered. Thank you for your openness. Another depressing note, I think we'll have to suspend now uh, to let the Minister and Mr Mitchell leave. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us okay. today.